to represent the podcast. I'm Aniki Shiru, racial equity coach for online business owners who want to be intentionally inclusive by building a business that is racially equitable. I created this podcast to normalize the conversation around racial inclusion so that fear is no longer the barrier that gets in the way of doing this work. This isn't about perfection, it's about progress. Whether you're taking your first steps or you're well-versed in the journey towards racial equity, this space is for you. So welcome home, friend. Let's get started. From coast to coast, out on the we are welcome to another episode of Represented Podcast with me, Annie Gishere, and I'm so excited to have Elma Acop here with me. Uh, we met in a very special way in terms of uh, listening to her amazing TEDx talk, which if you haven't, I am going to link that uh, in the show notes because you have to, you absolutely have to listen to this TEDx talk because it is so illuminating. It, it, it shifts your perspective about uh, feminism and the role of African women when it comes to feminism. And so Elma, welcome. I am so excited to have you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here and to to see how that TED Talk is done um, was, was never a thought of mine, never an imagination. And to meet people and have conversations with people that, you know, I never even imagined of is just such a great opportunity. So thank you. And, and and it has done so well. I think the last time I checked, I checked last night and it was uh, close to 400,000, 400,000, like over a quarter of a million, you know, views. And uh, that is incredible. And you did this a couple of years ago. You were only 22 years old. Why that topic? Why that topic of dangers of Western feminism to African women? Yeah. At that time when I was 22, which was about two years ago, um, the world was doing a, a big shift towards the feminism movement. Now, I'm based in South Africa, and so that shift was also very great. Fix this mic. There we go. Um, that problem is also very great over here in South Africa because there is the issue of femicide that we have been grappling with. And so women felt that the only way they could fight that problem was if we all came together and we stood for feminism. And so I found myself really grappling with this idea of feminism and where do I fit in? Am I doing it because the masses are doing it? Am I saying I'm fully feminist? Do I believe if I am fully feminist, what makes me fully feminist? And so asking myself all of these questions at a young age, and I've always seen the TED platform as an opportunity to share ideas, yes. regardless of what you think the idea is, whether it, you think it's a great idea, a bad idea, it's to share ideas. And my passion in life is to get more Africans speaking about African ideas, African stories, and African opinions. Mm, I love that because in the current world we are living in, and actually, let me not even say the current world, the world that we were born into, the world that we know as it is, has always had a narrative that did not promote African stories. Our our stories often feel as though they've been they've been hijacked and told by yeah. somebody else, be it because sure. of colonialism or through um, uh, enslavement, our stories have been taken away from us. And, and so I love the idea of looking at the, the TED platform as how can we tell our stories? And, and in your TEDx talk, you talk about, you know, uh, Africans having solutions for ourselves, not looking to the West or the global North, as the beacon to tell us what to do, but rather uh, we have the ability to find the solutions for ourselves. And so I, I would love to know, what does feminism mean to you uh, in terms of being an African woman? Mm. 
That's a great question. And I spend a bulk of that TED talk saying I don't know the definition of feminism because it's changed so much. And that's an essence part of it, that it's so ever changing that I felt I could no longer relate to it. And so when I look at feminism from an African perspective, I feel like I am looking into a store from a glass window. So I feel like I can see feminism. I feel like it's tangible, but I feel like I can't get to it because I don't know there's something and it's glass, it's see-through. It's not like a big gate. It's, you know, it's a see-through glass, but I can't get to it because my situation is somewhat different. And so feminism that I've come to know is an ideal what I want it to mean, and again, this is the TED Talk happening all over again. What I want it to mean is empowerment, equality, access, the ability to wake up and say that I want to be an engineer and not have anyone tell me that I can't. The ability to go to school regardless of my gender, the ability to fight in war, the ability to choose. Feminism now, unfortunately, feels like I need to fit a certain criteria. I cannot choose to be a stay-at-home mom because that is not feminist. I cannot choose to serve my husband willingly because that is not feminist. I also cannot choose to be religious because that is not feminist. And so that is what I mean by the glass wall is there. The ability is there. The reach is there. The choice is there, but something stops me from being able to reach it because I am African. Oh, that's powerful. That is like the glass, the glass uh, analogy. I can see it. I can feel it. And going back to what I just said a few minutes ago, do you think that this is very much driven by others who have defined what feminism is and therefore have left an entire group of people out yeah but in the spirit of it's for us but is it really for all of us or a select group of people so so important because if we go back to that store analogy we don't own the store so the store has set up the designs, you know, it's set up the outfits, whatever it needs to be. And we're looking at it from the outside. And so it definitely does feel like that. It feels like a movement that was created outside, was designed outside. And now we are frantically trying to fit into it. And we keep hitting a certain nerve where we go, oof, that sort of goes against my culture. But you know what? I'll, I'll still try and fit into it. We're fitting into something that wasn't created for us or by us. And that's not to say that you can't be feminist. That's to say that, look, if you find, you know, if you're comfortable bending and winding yourself to get in there, go ahead. But at the same time, if you're not comfortable, I'm trying to say that as Africans, we can have our own thing. We can, you know, we do not need to be restricted by this definition that has been passed down by decades, because as you know, and as I say in my talk, feminism is a Western construct, whether we like it or not. It was created in the West. Now, that's not to say that they weren't powerful African women. They were, they still are, and they always will be, right? But we had our own reason for power. We had our own guidelines for power. The Western ideology of feminism was just women, white women saying, we want to work. That was it. And at that same time where they were saying, we want to work, black women were saying, we want to live. And so the definitions of it, even when it was founded, were just you know, miles apart, you couldn't compare it. And so we've been playing the catch up game since the beginning. Now people are saying, we want to free our nipples. We're saying we want to end female genital mutilation. We are still miles apart. Oh my goodness. Stay there. Let us stay mm. here because you make um, reference to this and you say it so well, whilst the West is advocating to be part of a nudist beach, so to speak, we as African women, Black African women are battling issues to do with, you know, FGM. Uh, and 
it is chalk and cheese. You cannot compare the two, you know, female genital mutilation and, um, you know, wanting to be free, have that free spirit. And the issues are different. And so how then, Elma, and, 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 and I'm not sure there is an answer even, but we're just having this conversation. Where then do we come together, sit at the table of feminism and everybody have a seat at the table where they yeah. feel included, where the issues they're bringing to the table are being listened to. Mm. And those with power at the table, because we can be seated at the table, Elma, but not all yeah. of us have power, right? That's true. What can the powers that be do when they hear those issues that are very much related to what African women are facing? How can we sit at the same table and these issues be brought to light and action be taken? Yeah. I think for us to reach that point, um, the powers that be need to come to the table without any preconceived ideas. And the essence of feminism is to have preconceived ideas, is to say, this is good, this is bad, this is right, this is wrong. But when you're sitting on a table with a completely different culture, a completely different race, your ideology of good and right can be completely different to their ideology of good and right. And so we need to come to a table where there are no preconceived notions, where you are hearing what is being said to you at face value without your existing bias or your existing understanding. I'll push the boundaries and go as far as saying this. There are certain cultures who till now strongly believe in FGM and are, you know, th that's what they're doing. They don't want to get over it. They believe in it. And how can we assist them by providing the correct medical facility in which to get it done first? The training, the anesthetics, the, you know, what, because if they're not going to change right now, they're not. How can we understand them and make it better? The end goal is to end it, but you need to understand it from where they're coming from. This is culture. This is who they are. They're not seeing the wrong in it. And so when we start tackling issues like that and we think, okay, we're not going to come from a point of you are wrong, you are bad, this is wrong, this is bad, it is anti-feminist. We're going to come from a point of how can we make it safer for the girls? How can we make it safer for, how can we introduce choice? Because there are some ladies who do it as a choice. And yes, we can all argue and say that, you know, it's a brainwash, et cetera, et cetera. We have the freedom to choice as human beings. And so if this is the choice that you've made, how can we make this process more safe for you because at the end of the day we are concerned about your safety your well-being and your mental health can we provide counseling afterwards can we provide the right medical facility can we give you or lend you a practitioner who is qualified enough to do that those are and i know that that's as extreme as it gets and i know that not everyone will agree with me mm -hmm. but those are the sorts of conversations that we need to be having the sorts of conversations where African women are coming to the to the table and not only African women, I've had, you know, um, Muslim women who have commented on the post and spoken about wearing hijabs and yeah. being proud of wearing their hijabs and having feminists tell them that, no, you're being controlled. You need to free yourself. That is a preconceived notion. Mm -hmm. Leave it at the door, enter the conversation and listen. We're doing a lot of talking as a society we're not doing enough listening. Mm -hmm. The idea of preconceived notion, isn't that what was part of a driving factor for colonialism in the first place, where, you know, the West came in, in the name of, we have to do something. We want to make it better. We have to make it better because of how yeah. primitive things are exactly. here. We have to educate the savages so to speak because mm -hmm. they they do not know and we must mm -hmm. show them the light and I think it is that same thinking but very much in today's way of life because a lot of people will say you know I I, I, 
I wasn't part of colonialism. A lot of white folks will say that. I wasn't part of, you know, uh, enslave, enslaving people. Those those were, uh, that, that was in the past, you know. It might be down in, in, in my ancestry, but it's not me today. But what have we adopted? What have we uh, made into what it is today that is still bringing that divide? And I love when you make reference to, Elma, uh, womanism and feminism. Could you school us just a little bit on that? Because I know you made reference to that in the TEDx talk. And this is a quote I believe would have come from the author of the book, The Color Purple. So please school us on that. <laughs> Definitely. I will try my best, but I will also refer you to the talk <laughs> when it did happen. But womanism to me is all inclusive. Feminism speaks of gender, women and men. Womanism understands that as a black woman, you are dealing with gender, you are dealing with race, and you are dealing with class. Those are three different levels of discrimination if we can call it that and so feminism cannot just impact the gender because you cannot just decide to be a woman today you will always be a black woman it's not race that you can take away and focus on gender and then tomorrow you go and fight you know uh black lives matter and then the day after that you're a feminist they go hand in hand they do. You can't allow them. And so womanism is all encompassing. It, 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 it drives into the intersectionalism of things. It drives into the idea of race theory, which is your expertise and what it is that a black woman has had to encounter to get to where she is and why she still has to include the family in her fight for feminism because it's part of who she is. The fact that she needs to understand that due to her past, her class is different to other women. And so even though she wants to be a feminist, she might not have the finances to be a feminist. Um, you know, she might not have the finances to choose that she doesn't want to do this or to choose that, you know, um, she wants to work in a certain field and be a woman of STEM. She might just be able to be a stay at home mom whilst wanting to be a feminist. And so that's just touching on the ideas of womanism, but there's, there's so much to it. It is all encompassing. It, it sure is. And it brings me to the topic that you and I are very much on the same page on and it's cancel culture. Uh, is it right? Is it wrong? We have seen it grow, you know, particularly over the past, I would say, four years since the pandemic broke out. And there's been a lot of a lot more social media presence, a lot more people uh, coming to the virtual table to to have conversations and share their perspectives. And during that time, there's been a lot of canceling. What are your thoughts when it comes to cancel culture, particularly when we're dealing with heavy messaging, uh, when it comes to matters to do with race, with classism, with sexism, all of those things? Yeah. To me, cancel culture, I go as far as saying cancel culture is dangerous because a society that is not willing to talk or not willing to listen is a society that will set itself up on flames because once you cannot sit on a table and have a conversation, all you can resort to is war. And so cancel culture is dangerous in the sense that it can lead to war. The whole idea of being able to have differences to miss misunderstand or to disagree on certain things is we can sit on a table. I can hear your side. You can hear my side. We can try and understand each other. But as soon as I say, I am not willing, I am not able, and I don't even want to hear your side, we are enemies for life, you know? Mm -hmm. And so cancel culture really has inhibited the, our, our ability to learn from each other as a society. As much as people like to say social media has, you know, exposed us to this and that, it has stopped our ability to learn because there's certain things that you don't even touch because you are scared of cancel culture. There's certain things that you can't even make a comment on because society has decided this is wrong. You cannot say it's right. This is wrong. And we're not willing to listen. Um, and so 
it stops your ability to learn. It stops your ability to be educated and to grow and to develop and to see other people's perspectives of things. Um, I, I remember when I even launched this TED talk, my mom's greatest fear was I would be canceled. <laughs> and I mean, this is a, this is a 60 year old woman who has experienced a lot greater in life. And her fear is that her daughter will be canceled. And what does that even mean? Does that mean she won't be able to show her face out again? Does that mean she'll start being bullied online? Does that mean when she applies for a job, this was going to be something people look at? What does it mean to be canceled? And how does one redeem themselves from canceling? How many years do you stay canceled be mm -hmm. before you can come back and say, you know, am I, <laughs> can I come into this room? or am I I've served time. Hello. I lost you there for a moment. Yeah. How long is it? You know, you've served enough time. Uh, get me out of this, um, you know, uh, uh, stop canceling me. I've served time. Yes, I, exactly. Who, who determines how long you stay away? But also, like I said in the TED Talk, who are the guardians of the galaxy? Who are the guardians who decide what is right and what is wrong? Because I'll tell you something. What was wrong five years ago is no longer wrong right now. Um, because our concepts are ever changing. I mean, the things that our parents would never have imagined to be normalized yeah. is now normalized. And so when we are setting these golden standards of right and wrong with no conversation hear me out they can be right and wrong we as human beings have guiding principles do not kill do not steal things that are not up for discussion but we cannot assume that we all have <laughs> excuse me we cannot assume that we all have the same access which comes back to the preconceived ideas if i have some knowledge and i believe that you have different knowledge let's share and understand each other. Mm. Uh, yes, I couldn't agree more. And, and I'm just chewing a little bit on, on what you've said there. And in particular, the fact that when we cancel people, we're taking away the ability to learn. Uh, yeah. The education piece is is, is removed from the equation. And I think what it also does, Elma, is we create a generation that believes what was believed then and gives birth to another generation. And before you know it, there are two camps and we just don't get along with those people. I don't know why, but it's been since, you know, back in the day and we just don't see eye to eye. And it does really bring that divide and that rift. And, uh, and it's because of those things, I believe, that continue to widen the gap, particularly when it comes to Western culture and our African culture, which is often still, still seen as needing to develop, like the kind of uh, yeah. uh, language that we use to describe, you know, first, first world countries, third world country third. you know and then now we're even trying to do better developed countries developing you know yeah. and, and those are the things that I question according to who developing according to is is the west still not developing like have they reached the pinnacle so they're not still becoming there's there there have they reached it and and and, and Africa is still you yeah. know trying and struggling to to catch yeah. up mm. 100% and I mean just just as you're talking I'm thinking about the fact that at some point slavery was good <laughs> you know if 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 slavery was a section that you couldn't question that was life it was and legal. if you were to question it you would be cancelled and so at what point does the conversation start that hold on this is actually not right. This is illegal. This is against human rights, et cetera, et cetera. If, if, if we have that mentality of cancel culture, we are heading to similar grounds. Because once someone decides this is right, 
we're all going to have to agree that it is. And that is scary. And like you said, the language that is being used, um, I've, I've always said when we say developed and developing, are we speaking specifically about infrastructure? Um, are we speaking about relationships? Are we speaking about family? Because there is no stronger family than an African family. You can't tell me that we are still developing when it comes to that. You know, and it's unfortunate that we were colonized. So, of course, we're behind, you know. Of course, we are still building up the infrastructural development. But see what has already been done and see what is already being done. I always say that some of the brightest minds come from Africa. Africa. And if someone were to do a case study and say, this person has created a windmill made out of recycled material that they found in the backyard versus this person has created a windmill, given all the resources they could be required to do it, who has been more ingenious? Mm -hmm. And I'll allow them to answer. Um, but yes, language is so important. We as Africans need to recognize that, that, you know, how we are speaking about ourselves matters just as more, because the more of us are having these conversations, the more of us are standing on, you know, when they say standing on business, the more of us who are standing on this idea that I am African and I'm proud of it, they will start to realize that, oh, so maybe it's not a bad thing to be African. It's not mm. right. Yeah, good Lord, it is not. We we are <laughs> proud to be Black Africans. We are proud to wear that because we know who we are. We are not defined exactly. by what has been written in books about us and not by us. We know where we come from. We know our roots. Yeah. We know our families. We know the faith by which a lot of us stand by. And I think this is sure. such a good way to segue into um, your faith. I, I stumbled over when I was doing a little bit of research uh, for this uh, episode, Elma, I stumbled upon you encouraging some students, I think they were uh, graduating, and uh, your faith shone through. Uh, and I thought this is beautiful because for me, I am a woman of faith. And uh, I wouldn't be where I am today having called Australia home for over 20 years everything that I've had to navigate as a Black migrant woman, uh, my faith has played a pivotal role. And it, mm. it it's it's what I stand on. It, it is yeah. my belief system. It is through, it runs through my veins and my existence yeah. and my identity. How has your faith played a role in where you are today? Your incredibly successful in what you're doing. Um, you're pursuing a PhD at the tender age of 24. I don't remember my life it, at 24 because it feels like a lifetime ago. And, yeah. you know, you, you've accomplished so many career milestones, many that uh, sound much older than you is still a dream. Mm. How has your faith contributed to all of this? Such a brilliant question because my faith is the foundation of everything. And I think that that's something almost every African can relate to. Um, we, we are, we are faith based people. We live on faith because most of the time is we don't even see the future. We can't see, you know, the, the, the goods at some point, but yeah. faith keeps us, keeps us going. Um, and I'm sure that those who are listening can relate to the fact that, for example, if, if you're Christian, so Africa is mostly Christian and Muslim. So let's work with that. If you're a Christian on a Sunday morning, regardless of what is going on, you're going to church. Yeah. It's not a conversation <laughs> of if, of why, of who you're going. Yeah. And so it just becomes routine. But at some point that routine starts to create this foundation on which you build your life upon. Mm -hmm. And so with me and in my life and having this faith, being raised up as a Christian girl, there's even this one time I did a podcast called I'm Christian first and feminist second. And then I was, I think, 18 and I was grappling with the idea of feminism and Christianity. Um, and I've been going through that process for a while. And I was telling myself that, look, in the Bible, when it speaks about the Proverbs 31 woman, it says that she 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 thinks of a land and purchases it like she 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 just thinks about it. You know, it's one of it's like waking up and going shopping for clothes. She 
thinks about it, she buys it. She owns different perfumes. She has workers. She makes clothes, et cetera, et cetera. And that tells me that I should own property. I should run businesses. Mm -hmm. I should employ people because I am a Christian woman. And so living my life as a faith-based, faith-purposed individual is saying that all of my achievements are not for me. They mm. never have been, never will be. My talents are not for me. My talents are to be used in the world, are for people to see that a dream realized and personified, mm. that it is possible. It can be done. It has been done. The more of those that we see, the more we start to believe it ourselves. There is nothing more depressing than dreaming of wanting to be something and not having any representation of that. Oh. Not having ever seen someone reach those heights because now I feel like my dream is not realistic. But as soon as I see that it's been done, oh, I know it can be done. And so that, like I said, is the foundation of my being. Oh, I love that so much. And as you were speaking and saying about the representation piece and, uh, you know, having dreams and not seeing anybody who represents who you are and wondering, is this even a possibility? And it reminded me of a conversation I was having with my daughter yesterday. And uh, she was like, so mom, who are you interviewing? And I'm like, ah, oh, you are going to love Elma. You need to listen to her uh, TEDx talk. And we just went into this conversation that was so deep. And, you know, she, she, she actually, she turned 11 yesterday <clears throat> at the time of recording this. And uh, she is just so bright eyed and just beginning to recognize African Mm. things and taking pride in it because we live in a country where we don't see ourselves represented where we are well and truly the minority and it takes going back home you know yeah. it takes going back home back to our roots to be reminded we come from you know so much wealth and not just wealth from a monetary perspective but wealth in terms of we have abundance of love we have abundance of belonging we have abundance of relationships we have abundance of you know food and all sorts of things our traditions our culture are rich we are wealthy and I think she's beginning to tap into that so when we began to talk about you and your work she just lit up and got so excited so I can't wait for her to listen to this episode which, oh, which kind of uh, brings me nicely to your dad and your mom yes. and the relationship that they have and they've raised three incredible women and so your your household I believe <laughs> um, your dad has he was he was made for this because he's yeah. in a household with women and mm -hmm. so he has had to have been brought up at a time or an era, or at least the people who brought him up, allowing women to be elevated, allowing women to take positions that mm. they're not traditionally given, that they're not traditionally yeah. um viewed in because they're very much from our African traditions women were almost treated like children to be seen and not heard their roles mm -hmm. were very subservient their roles were very um I'm just here to help and elevate the man I work in the kitchen and in the farm and I do what I'm told to do and I don't even think for myself but your dad an African a black African man has brought you up differently yeah and and just as you're saying that it's reminding me that unless I had mentioned it I don't think my dad ever knew feminism or ever heard of the word or ever studied it in such a way all he knows about women equality I mean gender equality women empowerment is due to how he was raised and so something had to have existed Something had to have been there. My grandmother doesn't know. There is no feminism in my dialect. 
right? Which means there had to have been something that was passed on to her that was then passed on to him that he passed on to his daughters that excluded this whole concept of feminism. And me making this talk was saying, what was that? What did you have? What did what created your ideology? What was your foundation of equality built on? And how come we're not talking about that? Why does it feel like the only thing we know about gender equality is the feminism that has been introduced to us? Mm -hmm. There was something else that always existed. And so like you rightfully said, um, my dad being in a family of all women, he had no choice. <laughs> he had to raise um, strong and powerful women. But even in that, he... He did a phenomenal job of saying, I I don't care whether they are women or whether they are not. I want an educated family because I know that education mm -hmm. is the key that unlocks all potential. And so I am privileged in that I had a father with that mentality who said at his young tender age that everyone in his family will have a PhD. Not many people wake up and decide that, but he did. And now looking back through his life where he's got one, his wife has one, his two daughters have one, and I'm the last one to get one, he has managed to say he's achieved that. Because to him, regardless of your gender, when you have that certificate that says, doctor, you are the most qualified person in the room. And when you speak, people will be forced to listen, regardless of your gender. And so being raised in that environment, like I said, it is a privilege. I'm very aware it is a privilege because not everyone is exposed to that. Um, and just, yeah, it's, 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 it's why I'm here. It's why I'm able to talk freely because we could talk freely. It's why he you know, taught me how to change a tire because he said, who else is going to do it? You know, um, I'm, I'm, I don't know who you're going to get married to. I don't know who's <laughs> going to be that figure in your life. So I'll make sure that you can do it by yourself um, and oh, things of that yeah. sort. So, so I am truly grateful. And, and more, we need more of that power mm -hmm. to men who are thinking in that way because even when it comes to matters to do with feminism and and going back to the talk that um Chimamanda gave on we should all be feminists we need men at the table this is not work that we can do in terms of gender equity gender equality we cannot do it on our own and that's why it brings me to the conversation around this year's uh, International Women's Day theme um, from the United Nations, which is count her in, invest in women, accelerate uh, progress, you know, finding pathways for greater economic inclusion. But I think yeah. the question I'd love to ask Elma is, who is her? Often these themes, I don't know, maybe it's the skeptic in me sometimes. And, and I am uh, uh, an optimist. I am very much hope-based and believe in the positive. But I don't know why when it comes to International Women's Day, and by the time this is, is going to air, uh, this podcast episode, you know, it will be ushering in International Women's Day. Uh, what are your thoughts on the themes that we have that come up year after year, but more so the count her in? Because I don't feel that everybody's being counted in here. What are your thoughts? I mean, as soon as you said it, I... I already said it gives, again, it gives the power to someone else who is making the statement of count her in. Why isn't she in the conversation already? Who are we encouraging to count her in? If anything, and especially when it comes to, first of all, let me speak about from a gender perspective before I go to a race perspective. Sure. From a gender perspective, as women, we have had conversations with ourselves for decades. We keep preaching to ourselves. We know that we are empowered. We know we are skilled. We know we have value. Do they? And so we are leaving men out of this conversation and we're expecting them to know, but we're not expecting them to be in the room, but they should somehow know um, what's going on and how to include us. And so instead of count her in, I would say she is counted in. Know her. 
know the women who are around you get to know her she's there she's skilled mm. she's ready to work know her and so if we could have men on the table who know who is in their circle that is enough you don't need to because counting her in is ticking a box it's saying that we've brought in a new female ceo We've upped the numbers, but do you feel like she is, you know, are you recognizing her? Do you know her? Do you know her skills? Do you know how qualified she is? Know her. From a race perspective, <laughs> I'll Elma, count her Oh in. my gosh. I'm, I'm getting tingles. Oh my God. Know her. Wow. Know her. That in itself, yeah. we can just end here. We can just, thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> go and get to know her. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> you know, um, powerful. And and from a race perspective, um, I would say, oh, there's so much I could say in this regard. Know who the her <laughs> there's no her and know who the her is. <laughs> right. Mm. So when you say her, who are you talking about? Who are you including onto the table? Um are you making sure that you are reaching to all of the different demographics? Are you are you really being, when you say you are being inclusive, are you picking um, the, the easiest accessed fruit? You know, are you picking what's the easiest to grab or are you actually going into the research and finding out who has the knowledge to contribute to this or to this conversation or be on this panel, et cetera, et cetera. So be very aware of who the her is. Um, know her and be very aware of who the her is so that everyone is being included. If if that that's that's the long and short of it. And, and you know what what I, I, I really want to drill in in terms of knowing her because it feels like we've now just changed <laughs> the theme from counter into <laughs> they should listen her. to this <laughs> <laughs> they should have spoken to us yes yeah, they should have spoken to you um so with with getting to to know her what i have seen and i'm sure a lot of black women and women of color and indigenous women what has been historically seen is we are uh, lock arms together and fight for uh, gender equity. And then when the door opens for white women and they get a seat at the table, be it that um, C-suite table, executive table, be part of a board, that's it. The conversation halts, yeah. you know, and even when they're counting how many women are in board roles, if we were to uh, dissect that from a race perspective, yep. the percentages would drop significantly, yeah. even though the, the, the percentages are already very low from a gender perspective. And so I think as we're talking about counting her in, there's been a huge um, uh, injustice in terms of who has been let in and yeah. uh, who has been counted in already and who is not known at that table because it's a lot of who you know that lets you in. And uh, if we don't know you and we didn't go to school with you and your name sounds different, then you're not. Yeah. And the corporate talk is you're not a good fit yeah. because, yeah. you know, we, we we don't know you like that. Um, exactly. And so what would you, and, and this is winding down to my last question here. What steps do you feel we need to take to get there? you know, there being for future generations of Black women, women of color, that goes beyond the lip service. Um, yeah. Because right now it feels like it's a ritual. It's just a, oh, you know, 8th of March, uh, International Women's Day, let's get together, let's have morning tea and cupcakes or whatever it is. But they and wear even, pink. <laughs> And we're, of course, and we're pink. <laughs> um, where, where should we, how should we tackle this so that it goes beyond just being in echo chambers and lip service? And, and, and I love yeah. what you talk about love when it comes to mm. doing this work. Mm. 
Yeah. And that's exactly what I wanted to speak about. As you were previously saying, Black women have always had an innate desire to raise each other up because we have a shared history. We have a shared history of discrimination. And so if I make it without anyone telling me, I know I need to bring a Black woman up with me. Or I need to bring a person of color up with me because I am the gateway to their success. In that same regard, we need everyone to have that sense of responsibility. We need black men, white women, white men, every other race included, to feel that innate responsibility that if I put my foot in, I have to bring this group of people up with me because of what our history looks like. Mm -hmm. And that can only be a result of love. Love that has no bounds and love that has no criteria. Because if we speak about qualifications, we are qualified and we are there. You just need to be willing to find us. And it takes, it takes an, you need to be intentional. It takes intentionality to it. It takes, that's why I was speaking about how choosing the easy access fruit versus climbing to the tree and finding, you know, this other fruit that is there because it's easy to find the person that is in your circle and your sphere of influence that fits the narrative per better. But it takes intentionality to say, no, I want to go out and look for this specific individual or this group because I know that if they are sitting on this board, they will have a perspective that none of you have and realize the benefit that it comes with having diversity on the table you cannot go wrong every time we hear of corporates getting into one scandal or the other because they've decided to release one advert of the other that represents you know one race in a discriminatory matter you look at the board and you see they were missing the representation <laughs> It benefits you from a profit perspective. It benefits you from a perspective of a shared knowledge and shared responsibility. And your company culture is benefited. There is no con to this. Mm -hmm. There literally is no con to being more inclusive. It just takes effort. And if we're not willing to take that effort, then we are taking ourselves backwards. Oh. And we're going backwards in time. And so in the TED Talk, when I say that as naive as it sounds, love conquers it all, I meant it because it's something that in today's society, we have given love, um, we, we've given a checklist to love. Love comes with conditions and a condition that makes us feel comfortable. The moment we take out the comfortability and we are able to openly and freely express love, we can listen we can sit together, we can break bread. And if we can do those three things, we can work together. Amen to that, sister. Amen to that. I I have loved this conversation so much, Elma. You, you have just brought the goods to the table. And I have so much joy and excitement about Others hearing this conversation, you know, especially white women who are asking themselves, how can I do better? How can I be more inclusive? Yeah. What am I missing? Because sometimes because of the society and the families and the structures that one is brought up in, one doesn't see these things. You know, the yeah. implicit biases that we all have, one doesn't see these sure. things until they're plugged into conversations like this that open their eyes and they go like, I didn't see that. I hadn't quite understood it that way until Elma said this and it hit home a different way for me. And so if fear was not a factor, how would you show up in your work? What is it that you would do differently if Fear was not a factor because I know you alluded to fear a little bit earlier when we were speaking ab about cancel culture. So if fear was not a factor, how would you show up in your work? If fear was not a factor, I would be able to showcase my undying passion without fear of being labeled an angry black woman. I would be able to, the same way that when men watch a football match, 
they stand up and they shout and sometimes they cry and sometimes they scream and they walk off and that is normal, I would be able to do that confidently and comfortably without being afraid of a label. Because when I'm passionate about work, when I'm passionate about the work that I do, I want to cry. It should bring me to tears. It should make me angry that I walk out. It should make me so happy that I am jumping and I'm being loud. If I had no fear, I wouldn't have to fine tune myself to make other people feel comfortable. Oh, okay. We, <laughs> we just need to bring this to an end because we can go <laughs> on. That is, I love that so much. That is just um, the full stop to this conversation uh where can people find out more about you follow you engage with your work tell us this is what we've been waiting for <laughs> so if if you would like to contact me i'm very easily accessible on linkedin and instagram i don't have anything super fancy on LinkedIn, it's Elma Acob, and on Instagram, it's Elma.Acob. Send me a DM. I'm always willing to listen. I've always said that my platform is a place for you to share knowledge. So go and disagree with me on a video. Don't worry. Someone else will disagree with you, and then they'll agree as well. But it's a, it's, it's a platform for learning. So come there with a heart to learn and to share. What a beautiful way to bring this to an end. Elma, thank you. I have no doubt that your future is so bright because right now you are lighting a path as you're walking. Right now, you've just lit up a blaze and we've just come along this journey with you on this conversation. When we talk about, you know, trailblazers, you've just done that as we were speaking to you. I have no doubt that your future is one that will encompass uh, great influence and power. There's something with the way you speak. It is extraordinary. You captivate with how I could speak to you for hours. There's so many ahas that have dropped down for me. And, you know, we, we're probably 20 years apart in age, but I feel like a little kid sitting down and just getting gems fed to me. Thank you ever so much. And I cannot mm. wait for the world to know your name because you deserve to be on every platform sharing your beliefs and people hearing your perspective. You're a gift to this world. Thank you so much, Elma. Thank you so much for that. That's all. Thank you. We are represented. We are represented. We are represented. Thank you so much for tuning in. Why don't you go ahead and hit that subscribe button and leave a review so this podcast can reach more online business owners and together we can begin to normalize racial inclusion in the online coaching space. I'd love to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where this podcast episode was recorded, the Wiradjuri people in central New South Wales, Australia. Music produced in Nairobi, Kenya by Patrick St. P. Mbaru and Kambua Mathu. Vocals by Joanne Matata. Represented.